My name is uh, Robert Habermeyer. Uh, you can call me Rob. Today I'm going to be talking a bit about the Polkadot network, which as Paul mentioned is one of those scaling solutions that we can use to sort of uh, bring blockchain into the future. Uh, I'm also here today with Jen V. Brevoir from the uh, Web3 Foundation. She'll be talking a bit about uh, how the Web3 Foundation is supporting Polkadot and also decentralization in general. Uh, here are our Twitter handlers if you like social media. Uh, if you forget what I'm talking about, just please read my shirt. Uh, so I'd like to begin a bit by talking about uh, five key problems with blockchain technology. So uh, the first is scalability. How many transactions can we push through each second? How many resources are being spent on processing these transactions? This is showing right now that a uh, blockchain technology is, is uh, seriously bottlenecked on the amount of transactions that we want to process. If you want to be competitive with something like a, a payment network of Visa or WeChat, where you process hundreds of millions of transactions every day, we need to uh, build some serious scaling solutions. Uh, the next issue is developability. So that's how good the tools are. How can developers actually interface with the blockchain? Uh, whether the APIs and the SDKs are all there. Uh, the third point is governance whether decisions can be made in an open way, uh, whether division, uh, decisions can be made in a timely manner to advance the blockchain with whichever technologies are beginning to emerge, with the new stuff that's coming out that the blockchain doesn't get left behind. Uh, the fourth problem is isolation. So whether the, the blockchain is suited to the different problems which are emerging, whether it's useful for more than one kind of application. And the last issue is applicability, whether the chain can actually be used to solve these problems or whether it requires second layer solutions, whether you can directly tackle the issues with the blockchain. So what Polkadot is, is uh, three things. So first, extensibility, that we can add new things onto it as they come on. So when you come up with a new idea for uh, scalability, for privacy, for uh, for, for a better smart contract system, you can always add this on to Polkadot. With scalability, we want to have uh, something like a, uh, a tree-like structure of chains where transactions are coalesced upwards and that you can have uh, essentially infinite scalability. And lastly, we have heterogeneity, which is that different kinds of chains can all be grouped together under one umbrella. So the current approach goes something like this, that you have a single chain, which has varying degrees of generality over applications, and it's grouped together very tightly with a consensus mechanism. So you have a, a, a state transition, this is the kind of transactions that are being processed. And then you have a consensus mechanism, something like mining, or proof of stake, or proof of authority, or, or what have you. And these two things are very, very tightly coupled. So in Polkadot, we say separate them. So we say, let's have a relay chain. This provides the consensus. It provides pool security, which fragments out all these different state transition mechanisms, whatever you could think of. And these are stored within the parachains. Furthermore, parachains want to pass messages amongst themselves. So imagine the, the current issue trying to pass a transaction between Bitcoin and Ethereum or Zcash. This is actually quite a hard problem to tackle. So the second thing that Polkadot does is that messages, transactions, or arbitrary data can be passed between parachains. And the relay chain also provides pooled security of the passing of these messages. So you can think of Polkadot as something like a pick and mix, that you can have all these different pieces which look completely different, but are grouped together under the same umbrella. That you can design an application that makes use of whichever pieces you like, whether they're public or private. So as I said, it provides uh, pooled security. So when you bring on a parachain, you don't have to actually gather the security resources yourself. You don't have to go out and build a community to start and secure the different kinds of transactions that you're trying to perform. That actually you can attach it directly to the security of Polkadot. And in this sense, you get trust fee transactions that you can use the security also furthermore to send transactions to other parachains. 
here's a diagram to, to sort of explain that notion that you have all these people who are working to provide security for the blockchain ecosystem. Some of them want to mine on Litecoin. Some of them want to mine on Zcash. And you get this split that 70% of them are on one chain and 30% on the others. Whereas with Polkadot, everybody who's trying to provide security can all do it together. And you end up with a, a shared collaboration under, under known rules. And there's no wasted effort. So it enables you also to combine public and open chains with private chains. So you could imagine a chain which provides its own security. It chooses to provide its own security, but it also chooses to draw on Polkadot security for the transfer of messages. So that lets you get secure messages from private chains to public chains. And this is actually something that might help you port a bit. Uh, for example, they were talking about uh, integration with private chains that you could have a, a, a chain, a private chain, which is controlled by a government or other, some other kind of identification authority, and this can send messages to public chains providing attestations. So now I'd like to focus a bit on the, what I would call the, the nitty gritty. These are the sort of deep technical aspects. If you guys seem to be falling asleep, I can zoom through that a bit. Uh, so the key thing is, who actually powers this system? So we have, we have four key groups in the, what we would call the security game. First of all, we have the validators. This is a proof of stake system. So the validators are the ones who actually validate blocks. They validate transactions. They validate messages. And they allow the whole system to advance. And we have nominators who assist the validators in some sense. They choose validators who they believe will behave correctly and they vouch for them by placing down a security bond. This allows us to minimize the communication cost between the validators, as in the more validators you have, the more communication must be done between all of them. So security is dependent not actually on the amount of validators, but on the proportion of the tokens which are staked. So nominators allow us to increase the security to the maximum without sacrificing the amount of, uh, without increasing the amount of communication which needs to be done. The third party we have are something called collators. So collators are one of the ways that we achieve scalability. That is uh, something you could consider in the sense of a, a miner today. So a miner on a chain today will look for transactions that are to be mined. And they will group them into a block and they'll create a block and they'll submit this to the network. That's essentially what a collator does. But a collator does this just for one parachain at a time, not for all of them. So you have one collator for parachain A, one collator for parachain B, and then all of them can advance in parallel. The last one we have, the last group of people we have, are the fishermen. They keep a watchful eye out for validators that are behaving incorrectly. And if they spot some misbehavior, they receive a reward. This is important to make sure that the system keeps advancing as intended. We have, in Polkadot, three kinds of parachains. So uh, first we have open parachains. These are ones that are directly integrated into Polkadot. These are parachains that say they want to draw from Polkadot's pooled security. Uh, they're the easiest to implement because essentially all you have to do is say how the parachain will advance. The second kind of parachain we have is the mode that will be most useful to consortium or private chains where it's something called a closed parachain. Uh, what this will do is essentially say, we have this state, it might be private, but it's secured by this consortium or this private authority. And if a transition is signed by this consortium or this private authority, then the closed parachain can advance. And the third kind of parachain might be the most interesting to you here, because it's how you would connect something like Ethereum to Polkadot. Uh, that is, not every parachain has to draw on Polkadot security necessarily at all. Obviously, when Polkadot launches, there are going to be so many different blockchains already existing, that Bitcoin exists, that Zcash exists, that Ethereum exists. And we want to be able to bridge these into Polkadot. So you would write some kind of bridge that allows you to pass messages between a chain secured by one consensus mechanism into the Polkadot network. And this will allow you to relay messages into all the parachains on the Polkadot network. So here, essentially, we have a, a diagram of what 
the network would look like. That we have at the center, we have the relay chain. We have the validators who secure it. And they're grouped by color onto different parachains. This coloring, this shuffling, is done every, every block so that each validator will validate a different parachain each time. Off the relay chain, we have hanging many different parachains. Within the parachains, we have collators, we have fishermen, but they, they uh, function independently and then they pass stuff into the relay chain to be secured. One other thing that's interesting about this diagram is that you can see on the right there, the pink, relay, uh, pink parachain is actually another relay chain, that we have a second order relay chain. This is actually the way that we intend to achieve scalability, that you could have relay chains that are hanging off of relay chains. Their security is drawn from the root, but actually the validators at the top only have to uh, verify these sort of conglomerated transactions that are passed up all the way. And this will let us verify a transaction which in reality might contain hundreds or thousands of other transactions. So one thing you might be wondering is why these parties actually bother doing these tasks that we've set out for them. Uh, the validators and nominators are awarded via a staking token expansion. So this is a proof of stake system. When they behave correctly, they are given new tokens. The collators will, uh, will gather parachain specific transactions fees. So if you're a collator and you are on parachain A and you create a block, then that block is included in the Polkadot relay chain, then you would get some kind of reward in, in parachain A terms or even perhaps in relay chain terms, that they're incentivized to do this. And the fishermen, if they catch misbehavior, also receive a portion of the validator's bond. So we have a validator who's misbehaved. The validator has put down a bond, some kind of stake, and then the fisherman catches them behaving wrongly. The validator's bond is then burned, but a portion of it goes to the fisherman. So they have an incentive to always make sure that everything is moving correctly. So in terms of achieving consensus, uh, of course, we're going to use proof of stake uh, in order to minimize waste. Uh, this will allow us sort of to uh, have slower, uh, faster block times, so that we don't have to deal with the uh, unfortunate realities of uh, orphan blocks or anything like that. Uh, and then we also have this notion of, of economic finality. So in a proof of work system, you have uh, a 51% attack. And this means that if you have more mining power than the rest of the system combined, that eventually you can overwhelm the rest of the chain. So in proof of stake, you can achieve economic finality. What that means is that even if you have more stake than the rest of the network combined, there is a block that you cannot revert without taking a larger loss than you would receive in game. And we also uh, intend to split validators into different groups so that we have all of these different consensus or all these different state transition mechanisms that are unified under a single consensus mechanism. And that'll let us achieve some degree of scalability as well. In terms of governance, we would prefer it to be stakeholder driven in that it's uh, voted upon uh, that there are proposals put forth, whether parachains will be accepted or removed. Uh, and also, that it would be community focused. Like, for example, each, par each relay chain block would be accompanied by a reward to those who have minted it. Uh, but not necessarily all of this reward goes to the validators who created it. Some of it could go, for example, into a community driven organization, decentralized organization, to fund the development of further parachains. And in terms of development, I can give you an update of what we've done so far and what we're planning on working on the next upcoming months. So we have a proof of authority consensus mechanism right now, uh, which currently consists of uh, either a fixed list of authorities who take turns issuing blocks, or a contract which can update the list of authorities. The contract can also have misbehavior reporting, so that if a validator or an authority is caught misbehaving, that the contract can punish them accordingly. Using these two pieces, we're going to build a staking contract and start to build a proof of stake system. We'd also like to integrate light client support. We have a, a, a working, still in an experimental stage, but working Ethereum light client, and we'd like to extend this to all the different parachains as well as the relay chain. And as well, we have a, a bridge between Ethereum like chains. So uh, afterwards, you can talk to Marek about that. Uh, but to build a bridge between, say, the Ethereum mainnet or the Covan testnet. 
And eventually, this would become the bridge between Ethereum mainnet and Polkadot relay chain. Next one. Uh, another thing we're working on is a robust set of peer-to-peer -peer networking tools. So there are all these different parties who are communicating amongst themselves in Polkadot. You have uh, different groups which constantly need to speak to each other. And furthermore, these groups are constantly changing. So we need a really good set of peer-to-peer -peer networking tools in order to make that a reality. So we're starting to initially modify dev P2P, which is the Ethereum set of, uh, of P2P libraries, and then also going to uh, try implementing lib P2P, which is what currently powers IPFS. Uh, and we'll try to build something that definitely fits our needs. And the last thing we're doing, which is also quite important, is to generalize over state machines, that we have the parity Ethereum node right now, but then we'd like to be able to specify something like a state transition mechanism in WebAssembly, and then to allow this parity Ethereum node to become any kind of par uh, blockchain node. This would eventually be able to run all the parachains from the relay chain. So if you'd like to follow the progress, we have some code up here at uh, the Web3 Foundation. Yes, so uh, we also have a few chat rooms, and uh, there's a, a tech website if you'd like to learn more details at uh, polkadot.io. All right. <laughs>